folks, my name's Gareth Mitten. Uh, proud to say that I was published uh, through Engine Books earlier this year in May of 2020. My debut novel, Pedestal, is a science fiction novel that I like to describe as man reinvents God through technology. Um, and you can get it anywhere that you buy your engine books, uh, including uh, a little shop online called Amazon. I've been asked to read a chapter from Pedestal um, to mark uh, the, the engine con, and uh, I'm excited uh, to do that. I've chosen a chapter called God's Earth. Um, in this chapter, this super AI that exists uh, in, in, the, in the, this alternate game world uh, in the book, is having a chat with the mysterious father figure and also his sister, strangely enough, is there. So this is uh, God's Earth. When did it all begin? I asked father as I skimmed stones off the surface of the shimmering lake. I could get them further now. Four or five skips. I was growing, getting stronger. Are you asking me? He was sitting on a bench a couple of meters behind me. Why don't you tell me what you think? How about a decade ago, when people began voluntarily placing tiny robots in their brains? How about a few decades ago, when President Samuel Westheimer first unveiled his sweeping answer to all the world's problems? I can see that society's ills are of great interest to you. Lay it out for me, start where you see fit. The conundrum was what to do when the world began to succumb to the inevitable atrocities its inhabitants long ignored in the interest of their own personal gain. The decimation of the environment, the rise of global terrorism, the mishandling of population growth. You seem confused. You've absorbed so much information. I turned. I didn't like the suggestion, but father was right. I was confused. The entire history of the species had been a lot to take in. What's the common thread? How did we get here? I know the what. Explain to me the why. I looked out over the lake. I saw the behemoth city above revealing itself through parting midday clouds. The divisive nature of humankind. Explain. I realize that for as long as man has existed, his biggest downfall has been his all-consuming all preoccupation with himself. Everyone shares the burden of guilt for what this planet has become. I see debilitating wars fought between tiny nations, both sides fighting in the name of God. And what of God? He jumped at the chance to get me talking about that subject. God had nothing to do with it. For centuries, man has fought only to promote his own image. By the end of the 20th century, civilization as humankind had long convinced itself to see it, had begun to evaporate into utter chaos. The tired and the defeated were positively rubbing their hands on the eve of the new millennium, cheerfully relaying centuries-old doomsday predictions. You think humankind is bent on its own destruction? They've seen it all. The devastation of floods and earthquakes, the raging anger of spewing volcanoes, the never-ending wars and cold acts of terrorism, and even as the earth crumbles beneath them, people continue to demonstrate the one instinct they all share, self-preservation. Like a wrinkled, contorted old man ravaged by the kind of unnatural age modern medical advancements permit, people wake every day and do all they can just to stay alive, and in a macrocosm of the whole relentless process, society echoes the exact same instincts. It is those who truly feel they have something to live for that desperately cling to their lives. It is those who truly feel they have something to live for who build sprawling cities above the crumbling earth, running from the dying planet, just as they do from their crumbling bodies. Are you angry? I thought about the question for a moment. No. It wasn't that simple. I'd been given great power, limitless insight, unbound knowledge. I was still young. It would take me time to process. I was not angry. I feel sad. I explain. Those who feel they truly have something to live for do not wish to live for the things that are really worth living for. These 
are the things so drowned out by the noise of the world. These are not God's things. They are humankind's creations, spun from the fibres with which God spun the material of his world, but not of his world. Humankind is becoming the creator. Humankind no longer lives on God's earth. It exists in its own world, a world conjured by ruthlessness and greed. The earth is shattered, but its lifespan limited. Humankind builds its way out. But doesn't God live in all his creations? I skipped another stone. It skipped four times, then five, then six. It skipped on and on, a dozen times or more, before going too far for me to see. This piqued Father's interest. He came to stand beside me, looking out over the water. If God only exists through faith, and there is no one left willing to believe, how can God survive? I looked him in the eye. I could see the statement troubled him. I patted him on the shoulder and walked over to the tree line where my sister was standing still and staring at a tree branch. What is it, sister? A chrysalis, she replied, smiling, not taking her eyes away from the little green sack dangling from the branch. The caterpillar climbed all the way up there, all the way up from the ground. Can you imagine how high that was for a caterpillar? It's a long way to climb, I agreed. It climbed from the dirt to where it never belonged, determined to become something else, something beautiful. I looked at my sister's big, saucer-like eyes. She was beautiful, pure, guarded from the ills I was expected to observe and endure. She was all that was good in me, my moral guide. I think I saw it move, I said. Her eyes widened still more. Really? I don't see. Yes, look. I pointed to the chrysalis, the little green sack shaking, a crack beginning to appear. She jumped excitedly. It's happening, she yelled. The ugly sack cracked and parted, a butterfly, all the colours of the rainbow emerging, tentatively at first, stretching out its newly woven wings. It's so beautiful, she said, squealing with glee as it gently took flight. We both watched, smiling as it fluttered in circles through the air. Such freedom, she said, holding out her index finger to allow the insect to land. That which was so imprisoned, now so free. Not imprisoned, father said. He made his way over slowly from the lake. Only protected, until such a time it was developed enough to show its beauty to the world. The butterfly took off the girl, excitedly chasing it. Such beauty, he said. You really don't see God in all of this? God is humankind's creation. People need a higher power. They need to feel someone or something is watching over them. Scape? Yes and no. It used to be that. From their earliest years, children were warned about the omnipresent eyes of their creator. Now there's scape. Humankind has forgotten what it means to have the right to privacy. I picked up a nearby stick, reaching up to poke the empty chrysalis from the tree branch. It fell soundless to the ground. Look at this world we are living in. The human race at the peak of its development, a mother earth staring down the barrel of a cosmic gun. I crouched, picked up the hollow shell. I strained to see the upper portions of Hope City above through the thinning cloud. A world where metallic man-made sores infest the land's surface, the great escape. I stood examining the intricate structure of the chrysalis, turning it in my fingers, shifting it from palm to palm. You see scape as humankind's replacement for God? Father asked. What do you know of God? I asked him. I could see he was taken aback by the question. I hadn't spoken to, spoken to him this way before. I hadn't confronted him. I suppose, he answered, I know as much as the next person. I felt for him in that moment. There was sadness in his eyes. The interminable confusion of people. The question for all their learning and stirring and striving and making and doing, they could by design never hope to answer. What does it all mean? What are their lives for? I placed a reassuring arm on his shoulder. It isn't your fault, 
but you can never comprehend the things I have seen. You are part of the experiment, and as such you cannot set yourself aside in any kind of objective way in order to look at it. You know that the things about you know that thing about the observer influencing the observed? Well, it works both ways. We can never know enough, can we? People, I mean. The answer will always elude us. Look at it this way, I answered. John Doe wakes up in the morning to be confronted by escape interaction. John's interaction with Scape will, to an extent, be down to his own discretion, but Scape's knowledge of John is completely out of John's control. Knowledge, Father nodded. And we all know what that is. Power. Yes and no. Scape has knowledge of 99% of the people on the planet, more accurately, information, age, address, place of work, biometrics, DNA signatures, so what? Base facts about everyday John have been stored and filed and kept away for a very, very long time throughout the history of mankind. Then comes technology that looks at you, talks to you, as well as storing information about you. Scape is everywhere. Scape is omnipotent. It is to some extent with all people all over the world. Much of what is inside of you is quite likely inside of Scape. I held up the hollow chrysalis and peered inside. But scape is not inside of you. Scape is not God. Father nodded. What stops scape from becoming God? It seems it would have all the tools. I clutched the chrysalis tight in my hand. Because it cannot extrapolate. It cannot judge. And it cannot create. I release my grip and a kaleidoscope of butterflies comes flying out of the chrysalis. Sister screeched with delight and came running to dance and spin in the cloud of fluttering colour. It was the first time I saw fear in father's eyes. Neat trick, he said. You want to know what I see, father? I see above the plates and I see under. And everywhere I see the same story. God created man. Man drowned out God. And man began recreating God on his own terms. Man in the image of God. Man's distortion of the image. Father looked at me with grave concern. Man's recreation of God in his own image. But don't forget, it was man that twisted God, not the other way around. I breathed deeply. The environment expanded and contracted. We were at once transported to the arena. We have much work to do, Father. And that's the end of the chapter, God's Earth. There are several more chapters in the book, Pedestal. Um, also um, planning to get this out on an audiobook format uh, in the new year, so look out for that in 2021. Thank you and have a fantastic remainder of the engine con. Bye now.